Hello, welcome to my channel. Today we're looking into the disappearance of Ralph Nesland, and he's been missing since August 1980 from Lopez Island, Washington. And he was 79 years old at the time. And you can pause this and read it, but I have other tabs that I'm going to read. So I'm not going to read this one, but like I said, you can pause it and read it. So... I might have to pause it a couple of times because it's rather lengthy. But that way it's here. Okay, now on to the next tab. And we have this one. And this one says that they um, transferred his pension money to his wife fearing he would lose it in a lawsuit. So some of them say that she did it without permission and some of them say that she had permission so okay so this is historylink.org Ruth Le Le Nesland murders her husband Ralph Nesland on Lopez Island on August 8th 1980 she goes by her middle name Ruth it said that on the other page um, August 8th 1980 she shoots her 83 year old husband twice in the head after a violent argument over his purloined retirement fund with the assistance of her her older brother. She disposes of the body by chopping it up with a butcher knife and an axe. And they said that her brother actually did that, but I'm, I'm not sure. Incinerated the pieces in a burn barrel and dumping the ashes in a pile of manure in the back of their Lopez Island home. After colleagues report he's missing, the sheriff's department opens a missing persons investigation, eventually charging her with murdering her husband. Um, she finally stands trial after a month of testimony She's found guilty of premeditated murder. The judge sentenced her to life in prison where she will die of natural causes. But there's a lot more to it than that. So It said he gained notoriety in the Puget Sound area for single-handedly forcing Seattle's mayor and city council to stop um, equivocating about the construction of a high-level span over the Duwamish River to West Seattle, a controversy that had been ongoing for more than a decade. On Sunday, July 11, 1978, at 2.58 a.m., the M.V. Chavez, see, and I thought it had a different name, a 550-long-foot freighter, I think there's another name they call it too, piloted by 80-year-old Neslin, collided with the North Draw Span of Spokane Street Bridge, number one, also known as the West Seattle Bridge, damaging it beyond repair leaving it permanently in the open position. The accident resulted in the construction of a much-needed six-lane, 157-foot-tall high-span bridge and freeway, eliminating the notorious bottleneck at Harbor Island and directly linking West Seattle with the Alaskan Way Viaduct Interstate 5 and the city. Many West Seattle citizens thought the new span, dedicated on July 14, 1984, should be named after named the Rolf Neslin Bridge, but the city's Board of Public Works opted to name it the West Seattle Bridge for its geographical location. Two weeks after the accident, he retired and went home to live with his wife in their sprawling house on the south end of Lopez Island. Shortly thereafter, the domestic life began to deteriorate. And I don't know if it was then or if it already was, because both were drinking heavily and they were arguing often. Some of their confrontations ended with violently with property destruction, and physical injuries to both parties, and sometimes the police had to be dispatched. So, and then suddenly he just disappeared. It says in February 1981, the PSPA contacted the Sheriff's Department and reported they had been unable to contact him. Um, Ruth, claimed, Ruth claimed that he had just gone on an extended trip to Norway. So... But they discontinued his $1,200 a month pension payments until they heard from him. Meanwhile, the Sheriff's Department decided to open a missing persons investigation into his sudden disappearance and sent two deputies to the residence to talk to her. In April 1981, Donna Smith, her niece, contacted them trying to locate Ralph and but the Pilots Association hadn't heard from him. She talked with her sister. And they decided to go, see, I've heard different stories on this because, see, there we go. Ruth Neslin had phoned both sisters on August 8th, 1980, confessing she had killed her husband and was burning his body 
outside in the backyard. Since she appeared to be intoxicated, they didn't believe the story at the time because it sounds crazy. You know, who's going to believe that? When you hear something and somebody's telling you the truth, even though it sounds crazy, a lot of times you won't believe it because it doesn't, it doesn't fit in your mind. But now it seems plausible. Stroop gave a written statement at her local sheriff's office about the phone call, which was set to the San Juan County Sheriff's Office. On April 12, 1981, they obtained a search warrant for the property to search for evidence. Um, they went over there with a criminalist, and they served the warrant the following morning and searched for seven hours, but they didn't find anything. But then later on, they do, so... Yeah... So they had both Ruth Nesland and, I'm skimming, her brother, Robert Myers, were summoned to testify under oath. They both denied that he had been murdered, maintaining he had either returned to his native Norway or possibly committed suicide because he was despondent over the fact that his career had ended like that. So in February 1982, Clever located Paul Myers, another of Ruth's brothers, living in in Oregon and traveled there for an interview and he said both Ru Ruth and Robert told him about the murder in great detail and he described places in the house where the traces of blood and other evidence would most likely be found so he told them about his sister and his brother killing her husband. Paul Myers was brought to Friday Harbor in order to testify before the court. Can you imagine testifying against your own brother and sister? So they got another search warrant, and they found evidence. They removed two large chunks of stained concrete from the living room floor with a jackhammer, cut out sections of carpeting and padding, and took three pieces of the living room ceiling. They also used a backhoe to dig up portions of the property, including the septic tank and the drain field, to search for forensic evidence, but I don't think they found any of that. And they found a gun, the 38 caliber revolver, and I believe that was in her dresser. So then they had to wait for the laboratory to process the evidence. So, yes. So then they go to court. And it says, without a body, the prosecution's challenge was to establish convincing evidence of a murder taking place. And they were able to do that. And this is one of the first cases, I believe they said, in the state of Washington, where someone was convicted without a body. So then they... Um, went to press charges against them for murder. And Fred Whedon went on the offensive and filed a civil suit against them for a violation of her civil rights and asking for 850000 in damages because they had been on the property for 10 days during the ex execution of a defective search warrant, he said. so, And they filed a motion to suppress all the evidence that was seized, but... They rolled against it, so, and then this goes on. It's kind of lengthy, but it's really interesting. It says, a few days before trial, she fell and broke her hip, forcing another six-month delay because she had had medical problems and health problems during this time. And I can imagine it's a stressful time because she's afraid she's going to go to prison. So... Her attorney hadn't filed the usual request for a change of venue, believing that the community sympathy, because the community sympathized with her and support would be in her favor. Somewhere, I believe it said that several of them had put their properties up for her. Um, did I pass that already? I think it was like 14 people put their houses up for her. So, maybe I haven't gotten to it. Uh, civil rights ask, okay, maybe I haven't gotten to it yet. But nobody would ever do something like that for me. That's crazy. So, jury section began. Um, let's see. He potent Judge Bibb sent potential jurors instructions. This has a lot of information that you can read. I'm just going to skim through it. But he sent them a 14-page questionnaire asking a number of general, general questions and whether they knew any of the possible 150 witnesses because otherwise it would have taken them forever probably to ask them all those questions. So then she suffered a respiratory problems and delirium tremors, a result of alcohol withdrawal. So 
it, it took even longer before they had the court. And the, then the trial began. And so there were several trial delays and interruptions caused by her health problems and her excessive use of alcohol. And he ordered that she stay in the island's convalescent center and Friday Harbor each night, except for Friday and Saturday during the remainder. They rested its case on Monday afternoon after 12 days of testimony. The time had come for her attorneys to present her story of the disappearance to the jury. So, Whedon had saved his opening statement for the defense phase of the trial and told the jury that Ralph Neslin knew that Ruth had moved all the funds of the account she alone controlled and he approved. He was worried that he could be sued for damages he caused to the street bridge in 1978. So this is insinuating that he had instructed her to transfer all the money into her private accounts, but we don't know what's true or not. And then they discussed um, him being despondent and maybe he'd commit suicide and, and different theories. And then he explained the bloodstains in the house could have been the results of home improvement accidents, nosebleed, nosebleed, and other things that happened over the years. So, and they said that the information from her relatives was false and never happened. Mm. And that witnesses saw him on the ferry boat two days after the murder allegedly occurred and finally the defendant planned to testify. And, and I would believe that. I would believe that as a possibility because I have family who would, I believe, in my opinion, would do things like that to me. During Whedon's, especially if they believed it to be true, they might say things like that. But that's just my opinion. During Whedon's direct examination, she told about her marriage, her health, her alcoholism, and her version of the period leading up to Ross's disappearance. But on cross-examination, prosecutor established that her relationship with her husband had become increasingly violent. She either denied or claimed she couldn't recall certain events. So, and then they attacked her version of events and talked about sworn testimony she had made during the 1981-1982 special inquiry. And Ruth ended her testimony declaring, I did not kill my husband. On Tuesday, December 10th, they called uh, Winnie K. Stafford, who had been her close friend since they moved to Lopez Island. She decided to recant sworn testimony she made before the court in exchange for granting of immunity from prosecution of perjury. She testified that Ruth told her the night of August 8, 1980, that she had killed him and that her brother was in the bathroom cutting up the body for disposal. So, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? And then Robert Myers was never charged because, and it talks about how he was suffering from senile dementia and kidney dialysis, and neither side was willing to risk calling an unpredictable witness to the stand. And then it talks about the jury deliberating, and they the names of three jurors were selected at random, as alternates and excused by the court and they had the other 12 jurors that and it was three men and nine women began their deliberations and after 33 hours 33 hours of deliberations over four days the foreman informed the bailiff that a unanimous verdict had been reached at about 7 p.m. on Monday December 16th Judge Bibb reconvened the trial and read the verdict that found Ruth Neslin guilty of premeditated murder with a deadly weapon, and he revoked her bail. And the sentencing was for January 13, 1986. Until then, she had to wait in the Island County Jail on Whidbey Island. After the trial, one juror told reporters that the smoking gun to convict her, it was an advertising offering their house for sale that had been published in the Friday Harbor Journal before the date she claimed Ralph had left the country. But that wasn't even their house that was up for sale. It was a neighbor's house that was put up for sale and she had been listed as a contact. But they had misunderstood it and thought it was her house. And that's why 
that's what the main reason why they convicted her was because the neighbor's house was up for sale and they thought it was her house. Although admitted into evidence, the ad apparently had little weight, never became an issue of trial. And because the jury's decision was binding after the fact, doubts they had no, they couldn't, you know, change it because, but that's, that's crazy. So on Monday, January 13, 1986, Judge Bibb sentenced Ruth Neslin to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 20 years. And then he ruled that she could be released on a 100,000 bail or 150,000 property bond pending an appeal of the conviction. So they were going to use her property, but it, it had already been used, so they couldn't. So the judge agreed to allow eight eight residents to use their property i do not know eight people that would use their property to secure a bond and help me be released from custody if i was in jail or prison i do not know eight people i do not know one person that would put their property up for me and she had eight people who loved her enough to be willing to do that for her and that is very interesting to me because they must have have had information that we don't have, I would think. In January 1987, she agreed to pay 6000 out of court settlement with the Sheriff's Department to resolve the lawsuit filed against them, claiming the deputies had violated her civil rights and damaged her property. The agreement prohibited her from discussing the settlement out of court and required her to sign a statement releasing them from further liability. So then she's out, she drinks again, she's driving a 1975 Dodge van, she hits two bicyclists and sends them to the hospital with critical injuries. So, and then the breathalyzer showed she'd been using alcohol in violation of her terms of her release on appeal. So they ordered her back to jail and her bond rev was revoked. And she said she unknowingly drank orange juice laced with vodka that some of her friends had inadvertently placed in her refrigerator without telling her. And that contributed with her poor eyesight was why she accidentally hit the bicyclist. So anyway, she's in prison now after that. And that's where she stays until she dies, I guess. She ended up having lung cancer, so... And, wait a minute, Judge Bibb was unconvinced and ordered her to begin serving her prison sentence, but stayed his order until September 23rd to allow her appeals attorney time to file another appeal. He said, it's uncomfortable for me to contemplate Ms. Neslin spending some su substantial period of her last years in prison or even expiring there only to have her conviction reversed, he said. So, anyway... So she was, ended up being transported by plane to the Washington Correction Center for Women at Gago Harbor. October 7th, the attorney in the case agreed to dismiss her negligent driving charge since she was already serving time in prison for murder. The injured bicyclists, however, were permitted to sue her for damages. So the state, the Court of Appeals upheld her first degree murder conviction. Her appeal had raised nine issues with judicial decisions made by the trial, all of which were rejected by the judges. Um, her earliest date of release would have been 2007, but then she was diagnosed with lung cancer, it says allegedly, and she only had months to live. So they were going to go ahead and try to, it seems like, let her out or something, but she died. It was caused by blood clot in the lung and poor health and inactivity, so she died in prison February 17th 1973 but the pardons had scheduled a hearing March 12th to consider releasing her for humanitarian reasons but she died before that could happen and then we have this at casetext.com state versus Nesland which I thought had some pretty good information but I'm not going to read all of it I'm going to scroll through it so you can pause it and read what I'm skimming skipping over but here 
it says Ralph Neslin disappeared August 1980 at trial Joyce Stroops the defendant's niece testified Neslin called her in Ohio and told her she had a confrontation with her husband during which he hurt her left breast and her nose and that Uncle Bob had held him and I shot him and he's now outside burning in a barrel see the information's different in different places uh, Palmar's Nesland other brother testified that he visited the defendant several times during 1980 and 81 and during one of those visits Nesland told him that she, he she had shot Ralph twice in the head and killed him according to Paul Myers he also overheard conversations between the defendant and their brother Robert Myers in which the two mentioned that after he was shot Ralph had fallen over a couch in a storage box and that they dragged his body on a sheet into the bathroom off the master bedroom Paul testified that the two talked about how Robert had cut up Ralph's body in the bathtub using a broad axe and a butcher knife and then carried the body parts in a wheelbarrow out behind the barn where he built a wood fire in a burn barrel and burned the other body parts and later dumped the ashes in a pile of animal waste behind the barn. Paul further testified that Neslin and her brother Robert discussed how she had withdrawn 75000 of his pension money from their joint bank account and placed it in account in her separate name. He had Ralph had gotten upset and had told her to put the money back or else, and Robert said that Neslin gave Ralph the or else. Winifred Stafford, Neslin's friend, testified as a at a state rebuttal witness as a state rebuttal witness at trial she admitted that in 1982 inquiry judge proceeding she had perjured herself when she gave sworn testimony that Neslin had not told her that she had killed Ralph Stafford testified that on the evening she went to the residence after Neslin called her and asked her to come over and that Neslin had told her she had shot and killed him in the living room near the living room couch and that her brother Robert was in the bathroom cutting up his body and she overheard Neslin tell her son Butch Daniels over the phone that Neslin had killed Ralph. Neslin told Stafford that before the shooting Ralph had become upset when he found out that Neslin had taken all the money out of their savings account and he did not know what happened to it. Neslin testified that on August 14, 1980 Ralph left their home on Lopez Island after having told her he was going to Norway and that she never saw him again. Neslin was charged with and convicted by a jury of first degree murder. And then it talks about admission of the Smith and Wesson handgun. When after they they found the thirty eight caliber Smith and Wesson handgun was seized was being found in the bottom drawer of a bureau in the master bedroom. Neslin contends that the trial court abused its discretion in admitting the Smith at Wesson handgun into evidence and that the state did not first prove that the weapon was used in the commission of the charge of a crime of weapons. Weapons not used in the commission of the charge of a crime are inadmissible. Recently, the Supreme Court disagreed that these two cases stand for that proposition and instead asserted. Okay, so I don't want to read up that. So, and then it talks about rejecting things. So. And then it talks about a laboratory criminalist testified that the Smith Wesson gun had been cleaned since it was first fired, but upon examining the gun under a low-powered microscope, he found eight small blood droplets on the face of the gun cylinder, one blood flake which was loose but was still adhered to the extractor shroud, and two small blood spots under the thumb piece, the mechanism which slides forward to release the cylinder. Which spots were observable when the thumb piece was slid forward? Each of these spots, subjected to two chemical tests, showed a positive result for the presence of blood. So, either the thumb or the either the thumb of the person operating the gun had blood on it, and in the operation of moving the thumb piece to open the cylinder, blood was deposited under and behind the thumb piece, or at some point there was a large amount of blood deposited on the frame and subsequently wiped off, but the blood under the thumb piece was missed. So, Grubb testified that the eight blood dro droplets were high velocity blood spatters caused by blood which is accelerated at high velocity, could have been caused by blood spattered back from the object into where the gun was fired and that the pattern of the blood spots in the gun was consistent with a high velocity back spatter of gunshot wound to an uncovered area of human being or animal from a distance of three feet or less. And Grubb's testimony was unrebutted. 
and you can pause that and read some more. So the gun's probative value is brought into focus by the testimony of certain prosecution witnesses. Joy Strupnice's niece testified that on August 8, 1980, Neslin telephoned her and told her that there was a confrontation between them and that Robert Myers held him while she shot him. And that the brother testified that several times during his visits to the home in 1980 and 1981, Nesland or their brother Robert in her presence stated that she had killed her husband. And on one occasion, Nesland said that she shot him twice in the head. So, and then it said the sheriff's sergeant... Robert Ingold of the Sheriff's Office in Portland, Oregon, who's an expert by training in forensic blood spatter pattern analysis, analyzed the minute blood spots found in the living room ceiling and determined that they were high velocity mists, which, based on their location in two separate areas of the ceiling, he determined had come from two gunshots. So, it sounds pretty convincing. And this is really long, as you can see on the right-hand side where the scroll bar is. So there's a lot. So I'm going to scroll down some more. It talks about the gun. And then it talks about impeachment evidence. And the sales receipts and things like that. And more evidence. And this has a lot. Illegally seized gun. So, and testimony to be stricken and evidence. And then it talks about, moreover, the records revealed overwhelming evidence of Neslin's guilt in her confessions and admissions, which were introduced into evidence through Joy Stroop, Neslin's niece, Paul Myers, Leslin's brother, and Winnie Stafford, Neslin's friend. Thus, even if the initial admission of the suppressed gun transfer receipt or the failure. So it's got a lot of interesting and talks about the closing arguments. And since there was no objection raised to the prosecutor alleged improper argument. So it, it has a lot. I thought it was really interesting. And I thought there was something else I wanted to read, but I'm not sure, because there's so much if I'll be able to find it. So, but it's crazy, because, and you can download this as a PDF if you go to it and read it. And there it talks more about the gun and the high-velocity blood spatters, the living room ceiling, very fine blood spatters, the presence of blood was detected on the concrete floor, the master bathroom blood stains, um, witnesses gave testimony which appeared to be violent physical altercations between the defendant and Roth and the threatening statements that the defendant made in regard to Roth. Um, Brooks Boy Bolon Jr., I don't know how to pronounce that, who worked at their pool, who worked on their pool in June 1980, testified that one evening when they went out to dinner, Roth and Ruth exhibited signs of a physical argument. Roth had a scratch and dried blood on the side of his face, and Ruth had a bruise under her eye. Later that night, he again saw Roth, who had more cuts and bruises, including a deep ear cut and a cut lip. After one fight in the fall of 1979, when the Nesland had locked herself in the bunkhouse, she called her niece, Donna Smith, and told her that if Roth came back there, she would shoot him because she was so mad at him. When Deputy Sheriff Gregory Doss responded to a call from the Neslin residence June 1980, the tablecloth and dishes were on the dining room floor. Roth was disheveled and had a bright red scratch along the side of his face, and the defendant also disheveled and with a puffy face was in the bedroom and said that she was safe there, and if Roth came in, she would shoot him. When the defendant's face was black and blue in July 1980, Roth said that he had decked her, and that the defendant said that if Roth said that Roth would never do it again, and pointed to a rifle. In a telephone conversation with her niece, Joy Strip began. I mean, Joy Strip between November 1979 and July 1980. Nezen said once while watching Roth through the window that she could shoot him from right there, and also that she would waste him and could burn him. 
and July 1980 in the presence of her niece, Donna Smith, the defendant said in reference to Ross something to the effect as I won't have to put up with him anymore or I'm going to do away with him or I won't have that problem much longer. So I don't know who was hitting who more or who is defending themselves more. So it's hard for me to pass judgment on, you know, how you would feel or what you would do in that kind of a situation. The evidence is that in about the middle of 1979, the defendant transferred most of the couple's funds, which were held as joint assets into accounts in her individual names. About rec the bank records and testimony of Floyd Waller a uh, bank manager revealed that Roth's 78,000 retirement funds, which were released in April 1979 to Roth, were used to purchase a joint 50,000 money market certificate on May 1, 1979. With the balance going into a joint savings account, the money market certificate and savings account were in the names of both Roth and Ruth. On June 25, 1979, Neslin redeemed the 50,000 money certificate early and had a new 50,000 money market certificate issued in her name only. On the same day, the entire 50,000 balance joint savings account was withdrawn and the amount deposited in a savings account at another branch in Neslin's name only. The testimony was that Neslin had a power of attorney from off and had complete control over his 1800 dollar monthly pension checks and it said July 29th 1980 Roth visited Kathleen Scheffler and Margaret Ronning and asked him if they owed him and the defendant money from prior transaction when they told him no he said he had no money and no funds in his checking account Roth wanted to revoke the power of attorney which he had given the defendant so that he could obtain some money and ask Scheffler to assist him in finding an attorney for that purpose he also mentioned changing his will to provide for his sons. So, on August 5th, 1980, when Roth again visited Scheffler, he told her that he was afraid of the defendant and expressed concern for his physical safety. He told her that he would return again on August 12th to pick up a title report on Lopez Island property, but except for a brief visit on August 6th, Scheffler never heard from him again. So, and like I said, you can read further into this. And you can make your own judgments because, like I said, it's hard for me to make a judgment for one or for the other. But it sounds like she definitely killed him and, and that's where his body went. So I don't think he's going to be in this John Doe, one of the John Doe's, but... It said, the blood-tainted physical evidence which was obtained from the residents, evidence of what appeared to be a relationship of physical violence and growing animosity between the defendant and Roth, with the defendant's declarations regarding acts of violence toward Roth, the defendant transferred the couple's funds to accounts in her individual name. So they had... They had violence going on between them and I don't know who was more violent or who started them or anything like that with the drinking or you know I can't judge what happened or who reacted more or anything with the drinking or anything like that because I wasn't there but you can make your individual assessments so I don't know who you know, you can be pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until you just go snap, crackle, and pop. And so I don't know what was going on. So I'm not trying to defend her or, or say that she was bad or defend him or say that he was bad. I'm just saying this is what it says on the internet. So. Yeah. So the couple's daughter saw her mother going to her home that Saturday afternoon about 3 that day. The defendant let his two daughters play with their mother's makeup, something that their mother had never let them do. At about midnight that night, the defendant and his stepson carried a heavy and bulging closed cardboard box, which was 3 foot by 3 foot by 3 and a half foot in size, from the bedroom into their station wagon. The defendant and the children then drove to an area where the defendant and his stepson buried the box in a 4 foot deep hole about 30 feet from the creek following weekend or so the defendant sold the victim's clothes and also the stepson's 
22 caliber rifle which his stepson had bought. Is this the same? Oh, uh, maybe this is about, about another, this is comparing it with another crime that happened, I guess, or something, I don't know. Similarly to Scott here, the defendant and her husband had a history of violent arguments and Ross's relatives and friends did not hear from him after August 1980. Although he, Ralph had told Kathleen Scheffler specifically that he would see her again on August 12th, 1980 and on August 4th he had written to his brother and his wife in anticipation of their visit in a couple of months. So... While no large box or other evidence of body is present in this case, blood stains were found in the living room ceiling in a pattern consistent with two gunshot wounds to the uncovered area of a human body or animal on the concrete floor. So, and it goes further into it. I don't want to read it all. But, like I said, you can pause it and read it. And I have another video that I did that has more tabs where you can pause and read more information if you're looking for information for writing an essay or doing some sort of research and that way you have access to it but and that way you'll have places where you can find so you can cite your sources but I just thought it was pretty interesting Nezla maintains that there's no as evidence from which to infer that she heard or understood Robert's alleged remarks that her silence therefore cannot imply acquiescence, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, as the appellant notes, Paul Myers was unable to specify the date on which the conversations occurred and he could not attribute any statement to a particular speaker. He was unsure of the number of conversations and whether a friend had been present in addition. Myers also acknowledged that he was pretty damn drunk at the time and that Neslin and Robert were probably also drinking heavily so and that's the thing if you've talked to people and spoken to people and gotten information while they've been drinking and you thought well that couldn't possibly be true but now you're realizing maybe it is true you should email the authorities or call them or email them and cc a few people and let them know because it might help solve a case and I don't you know it's hearsay so I don't think you know, you probably you may not be called into court or anything like that, but at least they'll have the information. Maybe and maybe some of the people aren't even alive anymore, but maybe you can give them the information and they can decide if it's important or if it's relevant to help solve cases for John Doe's or Jane Doe's or missing persons or any information you have in such nature. So, so this has a lot. Like I said, this has a lot. And I'm over halfway through scrolling through it, but I don't want to read it all. Um, so this talks about what's admissible. And I don't know. It just compares different things with different things. So to try to make their point and to try to, you know, try to win their point. You know, I may not be wording that correctly either, but it says the source of accusation was immaterial, only the reaction thereto being probative. Had the defendant been presented a stone tablet with the accusation there on her had the declarant been dead at the time of defendant's trial would have made no difference. So like I said, there's a lot here and I'm just going to scroll and stop and scroll and stop. So if you want to pause it. You can. Sufficiency of the evidence. So, yeah, because I'm almost to the end now. But I just wanted to show you some of the points. It says, secondly, the fact of a long marital relationship between the defendant and the victim and the evidence of a possible motive to kill distinguished the instant case from Bingham in which the defendant and victim were strangers and no evidence of a motive was introduced. So it's comparing it to other cases to make their point. So. That you can read it and you can look for interesting things. Maybe you'll find something interesting that I didn't point. 
Neslin argues that the enjoy your vacation remark should have been excluded because it is not supported by the record and is highly prejudicial. The state concedes that the remark is unsupported by Stafford's testimony and was a, clearly a mistake on the prosecutor's part. But no objection was raised. So, that's a pretty interesting reading. It's got some interesting things in it because it it, it mentions parts of the case that you might not otherwise read about. So, a new trial motion, and I'm to the end, thank goodness, but it's got very interesting reading, and there's other places. SeattleMet.com, and I thought this one's really interesting. It says, the last time the West Seattle Bridge closed was even stranger. When Mayor Jenny Durkham announced the closure of the West Seattle Bridge last month, it was one of the few, maybe the only bits of non-coronavirus news to break through and grab everyone's attention. The response on social media and elsewhere to that March 23rd edict could best be summoned with a big collective. Now this too, it was almost too much to bear amid a pandemic that's ravaging the city economically, psychologically, existent, exist, existentially, the primary commuting option to and from West Seattle, which carries 107,000 cars a day, was suddenly off limits due to the discovery of crack support girders, rendering the structure unsafe long after our COVID-19 troubles subside the span will remain out of service as repairs resume. The Seattle Department of Transportation says it'll be at least a year. Imagine, though, if it was longer, like six years, because four decades ago, that's how long Seattleites had to wait. In 1978, a freighter ship struck the span, then the Spokane Street Bridge, an eight-lane drawbridge similar to the Fremont or... Mont Lake bridges that will stand today. In the aftermath, one section of the drawbridge remained vertical, effectively, effectively cutting off half the state's most traveled roadway. Commuters suffered traffic limbo until the damaged arterial's replacement went up. Meanwhile, another drama played out involving betrayal, deception, and murder, much of it tied to the bridge's destruction. It says, Elliott Bay, June 11, 1978, 2.50 a.m. Through the dark, the freighter Antonio Chavez, that's the other name, noses south along the bay toward the mouth of the Duwamish River caught in the right light. The 550-foot ship is distinguishable by its black body, stretching nearly the length of two football fields. And it holds sits 20,000 tons of gypsum picked up in Oakland, California, now bound for delivery at the Kaiser Cement Plant just up the Duwamish. Near the back of the ship, a tower that resembles a white office building houses a quarter for 38 crew members, freight operator operations, and at the very top, the ship's fridge. The Chavez Command Center, up there filling the hum of the entire ship, moved through his feet, up his legs, his chest, is 80-year-old Roth Neslin, the oldest seafarer in the Puget Sound Pilots Association. Its members, like ship pilots all over the world, take control over the cap over from the captain once the vessels reach local waters. The pilots are completely, if temporarily, in charge by state law. What they say goes. Neslin boarded the Chavez hours earlier and guided it from the Pacific Ocean to the Elliott Bay. Now comes the tricky work of conducting the 72-foot wide freighter past Tiny Harbor Island and through the 150-foot gap of the Duwamish River waterway, a feat made all the more precarious by a number of docked ships and the narrow confines of Spokane Street Bridge, which is actually two spans, the North Bridge and the South Bridge, side by side, one for each direction of car traffic. Both draw up whenever it's time for a ship to pass. Roth Neslin's age is hardly the most notable thing about him, Born in Kongsberg, Norway, he ran away from home at the age of 12 by stowing aboard a ship bound for America. Authorities caught the miner in New York and sent him back. A year later, he attempted it again, this time successfully. A few years into his second time in New York, he landed at 16, a position as mess boy 
on the Ganges, a British merchant vessel, so began a 66-year career at sea, one which would put him in harm's way again and again. During World War I, he survived a torpedo hit on the boat he served. A quarter of a century later, during the Second World War, he, he captained the Andrea F. Luckenbach, a merchant ship carrying military munitions and part of a convoy bound for North Africa. On March 10, 1943, a German U-boat attacked the convoy, a torpedo striking Neslin's ship on the port side, killing 10 armed guards. A second torpedo sent the rest of the crew overboard, and the ship went down in seven minutes. A nearby ship rescued Neslin and his men. So that's really interesting. Fast forward 35 years and Neslin, one of the most respected seamen in the Seattle region where he moved after the war, his maritime prowess is only outpaced by his reputation with women, and that's complicated. Married, he had stuck, struck up an affair with his wife's much younger sister, with whom he eventually had two sons. After divorce, he didn't marry the sister, but another woman. Ruth, 20 years his junior, in 1978, he and Ruth lived in a sprawling, secluded house on Lopez Island, 70 miles northwest of the city. Shortly after 2.50 a.m., as the Chavez approached Spokane Street, the drawbridge lift, the signal that Neslin can proceed, then a series of missed signals between Neslin and the ship's permanent captain and crew members leads to the unthinkable. At 2.58, the Chavez slams into a support structure on the north bridge. Steel tears through the ship's port side. Splinters of wood and concrete rain down into the water below. The ship limps past the bridge, bridges and comes to a stop. See, at satellites wake up that morning to a city changed. So one arm of the Spokane Street drawbridge, drawbridge remained in the upright position long after the freighter crash. And that's a photo of it. So it says one arm of the north drawbridge, the damaged arm, stays stuck in the up position. Commuters, commuters must either brave the still functioning south bridge, now crammed with both eastbound and westbound traffic, or go as far as 20 miles out of their way. Authorities plead with citizens to carpool or take buses. They urge employers to vary office hours. Aerial shots show transit into the city. A spaghetti dish of elevated roads and off ramps snarled with bumper-to-bumper -bumper cars. The Alaska Way viaduct, which connects to Spokane Street, gets the worst of it. One late afternoon, a city traffic engineer tells the Seattle Times that vehicles headed home to West Seattle on the viaduct are backed up damn near into town. Yet, in some circles, the accident is met with glee. A few high schoolers screen print and sell t-shirts that read, where were you when the ship hit the span? Some locals even call if fastidious, I don't know why I can't pronounce that word all of a sudden, fastidiously, Ralph Nusland, a hero. After all, he destroyed what many, especially those living in West Seattle, wished had been torn down and replaced years earlier. A debate had raged forever about the traffic agony created by the bottleneck of the two ancient spans built a few years apart in the 1920s. His ship was able to do in a few seconds something the city hasn't been able to do in years, Penn Seattle Times colonist Ross Anderson, because now city leaders are beginning to secure funds to replace the bridge. Unable to reach Neslin by phone two weeks after the accident, Anderson continues, I want to ask if he knew he helped solve the problem that decades of official oratory committee forming and money spending had only turned into a bigger problem. Since the span was damaged beyond repair, and you can read further because I've been reading it. It says, Ruth Neslin said the accident destroyed her husband. The mishap, she explained, sent the proud sea captain and pilot deep into deep depression. But some people say he joked about it. So, and you can read the rest of it. I will scam down so you can read it because now it talks about what happened. But I love the fact that this had more information and different information than some of the other places had. So I wanted to include that, and that's the end of that. And I think of, oh, and then there's this book, and I 
have that online. There's a book that you can find when you go to search for information, and it has information as well because it has different stories. And it's by Gary C. King, but I can't see the exact name of it, but you can see some of it on the left-hand side. And so you can go through this and read it because I was going to read it, but it's been 49 minutes. So if I read that, it would probably be, what, an hour and a half or something like that. And because it's like 12 pages long, but, and I think most of it's been covered already, but it also will give you, um, if you need another place for sources and to cite your sources, and if this isn't available online, still you can find it here. Because sometimes you can find things and then poof, they're, it's like they're gone and you can't find them. Or you don't have access to that information anymore. And I don't know why, but it happens. So, and I don't know if I'm going to scroll through this whole thing. I'm not even sure which page I'm on now of the 12 pages that's just a portion of the book which I might buy because it sounds like it might be interesting and then there's some photos so I'm probably going to look up the book in a little bit West Spokane Street Bridge Collision because I love having books like that I've got one of them up there now so and this talks about the bridge collision on and Wikipedia and I was going to look at it, but I think that I've covered enough. So if you were interested in this, hopefully that's enough information for you. And there's, like I said, there's another YouTube video, but I don't read any of the information because I kept trying to read it and I kept getting phone call and phone calls and then I had to do things. And so I decided I would wait and have two videos, one scrolling through different uh, more websites than this and links in case somebody needed information maybe to write an essay or for research and then this one as well and like I said if you have information where people have been drinking and talking over the years and they've told you information and you're not sure if it's true or if it's or if it's relevant or if it might help them solve a case you should give authorities that type of information to help them with the case and let them decide if it's put the burden on their shoulders to decide if it's if the information is true or if it's real or if it's not going to help them with the case or if it might help them solve the case and you can email them and cc a couple of them or call them or however you want to do it instead of taking that information with you to the grave and not giving it out even though it's been years to help solve these cases and maybe Maybe some of these families will end up getting the remains of their family and be able to scatter their ashes or have a proper funeral or some sort of closure that they might need. Anyway, don't forget to pray for this family, the investigators, and everyone that's been scarred by what happened because this is just horrendous. And you can't, this has to have scarred a lot of people. And I just want to thank you for tuning in and tell you to please feel free to leave comments and I'm just a small channel and I don't have a lot of viewers and I appreciate my viewers and I love getting comments. So thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.